The Doug Wright Show. Doug scores big time interviews on Utah's most important stories on KSL News Radio. When I talk about big time interviews, holy cow, I'm looking at the roster and the lineup here, and it is really remarkable. Uh, two sitting U.S. senators, former governor, former secretary of health and human services. Wow. And th- th- Mike Lee is here in studio. Senator Lee, since this is kind of uh, of your second annual Utah Solutions Summit, I'm going to let you introduce us to all of these great individuals who are with us here in studio. Sure. It's a pleasure to be here with you, Doug, as always. I- I'm very honored to be here with two distinguished guests, both of whom spoke at my Solutions Summit today. Former Governor Mike Levitt, who served as governor of the state of Utah for 11 years, later served as EPA administrator and then as secretary of the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services, spoke today, as did uh, one of his former employees uh, and my new colleague, uh, new as of about a year ago, uh, Nebraska Senator Ben Sass. Uh, who is one of the bright lights of the United States Senate and one of my very favorite people in Washington. We are really honored to have you all here, truly, and I appreciate you spending the time, a very busy day, speaking over at the the uh, summit that we've been talking about and then taking the time to come over here. And uh, let me start with our former Governor Lovett. We were just reminiscing about all the hours and great times we spend in this studio behind these microphones, solving the problems of the world and uh, with Let Me Speak to the Governor. And it's good to have you back. Doug? I'm glad to be back. This feels quite familial and uh, delightful to uh, st- sit behind one of your microphones again. I'm here with two people I admire greatly and who uh, today will uh, who have a- an opportunity to really influence things. You and I can ex- uh, will get a chance to opine <laughs> a fair amount, but these two can really change uh, things, and I'm glad to be with them. Now, Senator... It's such a great honor to have you here, being a great senator from Nebraska. But I've I've got to just ask, uh, have you ponied up on the bet yet? We are headed there next. There's a lot of great (laughs) – Doug, thank you for having me. There's a lot of great reasons to be here. I'm a huge fan of Governor Levitt, and I learn from Mike Lee every day in the U.S. Senate. Uh, He's the idea factory of Washington, D.C., but I'm also here to pay up on that bet. I owe 200 pounds of pork to a (laughs) uh, a food bank from the BYU, what's known as Hale Joseph Smith play on the uh, (laughs) – the opening game of the year in Nebraska. (laughs) You know, there was quite a wager, uh, Senator. I understand that you would have to pony up some uh, Moroni turkeys, uh, Norbest turkeys, if I remember correctly. That's right. That's right. Uh, uh, Norbest turkey. We were ready to deliver those to a a food bank ministry in Nebraska. And, in fact, we've decided to deliver on those anyway just as a good measure, uh, just as a show of good measure to our friends from Nebraska who drove out here all the way from Nebraska so they could deliver 200 pounds of pork. And this is, I want to point out, this is literal actual pork as opposed to Washington-style pork (laughs) that they're delivering to the Utah Food Bank. This is the good stuff. The good stuff. The good stuff. By the way, one of these days Utah's going to grasp the concept of the pork tenderloin sandwich. You know, I married a Missouri girl, and so I long for that all the time. And... They're a little tough to come by out here. I wish you the best. I don't know how you could live without it. (laughs) Senator, let's talk about this summit that you have put together, second annual. What is the goal of the summit? The goal of the summit is to put together a group of civic and business leaders to talk about common problems that people are experiencing in their businesses, in their day-to-day lives, and to try to come up with solutions, especially some of the solutions that we can help to reduce to legislative form in Washington and ultimately help solve through Uh, change in the law that will help it make it easier for Utahns and for all Americans to do what they do best, which is run their businesses, provide for their families, and make this a better place in which to live. You know, I know, Governor Lovett, we've had uh, many a conversation about regulations and so on over now many, many years. And boy, if there's one common thing that I hear from the big businesses that we deal with here at KSL, the small businesses that we deal with here at KSL, it's trying to deal with the regulations that they are forced to. And I remember that famous op-ed piece. I think it was written for the Wall Street Journal by uh, former Senator George McGovern, where he was opining when he got into business after he stepped out of the Senate that he wished that he had known what the real effect of the legislation that he had championed and passed, thinking that he was doing something good, the real effect it was having on business. I've made the same observation. Uh, I spent 16 years in government. I ran for office saying I've built businesses. I know what it's like to build a, make a payroll and uh, complaining about government. Uh, I spent 16 years there. Uh, When I left the government, I concluded to start building businesses again. And uh, a few months after I had launched that that effort, I said to my wife, Jackie, 
um, you know, I ran for office saying I understood this, but there's something about having your salary appropriated that causes you to forget that. And I wish that everyone who ran for office or ran a major department of government at any level had a requirement to go back and build a business every five years. If they did, America would be a different place because actually seeing the effect of what you do is, uh, as a government official, it would be a very important insight for most. Yeah. Senator Sass, your thoughts on this? You know, I'm, uh, I'm new to government, uh, but I spent the last 16 months before being elected living on a campaign bus. Nebraska has 93 counties, and I was in all of them many times and uh, did almost 1,000 public events over the course of that year and a half and got to know people in every sector. Nebraska is the largest cattle state in the union, and I remember a handful of months ago when a rancher came up to me, and he was complaining about the EPA's new um, Waters of the U.S. rule, which happily was uh, set aside by a circuit stay the end of last Last week, I assume you might have covered that a little bit here. Um, and he was lamenting the idea that every puddle might now be subject to federal jurisdiction. I want to be really clear. Those of us who love the environment and think we have a calling to steward God's creation believe in environmental regulation. Um, the question is, what should be done at the state and local level and what things must be done in a one-size-fits-all way from Washington? And this rancher said to me, I keep racking my brain, but no matter how hard I try, I can't remember who I voted for at the EPA. <laughs> yeah. And he meant it as a joke, but it, it is a little bit tragic because our system of government assumes a world where he and his wife and his family, they're in charge of this country. And if they want to, inf- they want to fire the policymakers in America, they're supposed to be able to do that. And that's why we have elections. And so we need more clarity about what we do by rule and what is done at the state and local level and which things are done by legislation. So the people can fire the lawmakers if they make bad decisions. Boy, we have a person in this room with no small experience with the EPA. And I remember one time I, I would always ask Governor Lovett, you know, well, are you going to run again? What are you going to – and I remember I asked him if under George W. Bush in the second term if he was going to consider being the Secretary of the Interior. And he said, oh, no, that's one of the worst jobs in government. And then he ends up at the EPA. And so, <laughs> well, Doug, I had been at the EPA a couple of weeks, and a friend of mine asked me what I thought. I had spent the ensuing weeks uh, learning a bit about the job, and I said to him, um, look, the EPA – has more power than a than a good man needs or a bad man ought to have. Uh, there's not a piece of um, there's not a piece of American society that that the EPA can't find a way to regulate and to impair progress in. And as Senator Sass said, this is not about a desire for the environment not to improve. This is this is a a recognition that one must, in fact, balance, find balance between those both equally noble uh, uh, propositions. Mm-hmm. You know, I, I failed to ask you what would have been a really good uh, question a few moments ago. What did both of you speak on this morning? Because I want to get into health care. I want to talk about some of the other things. And I understand, Senator Lee, that we, we can do one more segment. Is that yes. correct? Yes, okay. That's right. All right. Usually I ask that and just hope that nobody will shoot me down. But uh, this time I want to make sure that your your time will actually accommodate that. But as as far as you know, when, when we look at, at some of the, the regulations and where we are and some of the things, I, I couldn't help but think this, especially with you, uh, Governor Levitt, and as former director of the EPA, we recently had that mine spill over in, in Colorado. And I kept wondering, I wonder how Mike Levitt would have, would have handled this. As you look at it now from the perspective of having been the governor of the great state of Utah and the former director of the EPA, your thoughts on that and, and the regulations, it was brought up over and over on this air by our federal delegation that if this had been a private entity, that things would have been considerably different. And when the EPA says, well, don't worry, we'll make everybody whole, that's with taxpayer dollars. I hope that the people who have a chance to think that through most clearly are people who serve in the bureaucracy of the FDA because Mm -hmm. there was serious damage done there. There were mistakes made, and I think the first thing that should have occurred was they should have stepped up to it immediately because they knew immediately that it had been there. There um, uh, had been errors that had had caused it. Um, I I don't have many opinions beyond that, but I I will Mm -hmm. say that First and foremost, I hope people there learned, and second of all, they should have been more transparent quickly. As we do go into this break, what were the the topics of your speeches this morning? And perhaps Senator Sass, I could ask you. 
You know, uh, Senator Lee has done a really nice job in Washington pushing that we need to be thinking about the educational and human capital needs of our kids and grandkids 10 and 15 and 20 years in the future, not just trying to fight the fights of yesterday again tomorrow. And so we talked a lot about the higher education credentialing process and the nature of what the economy is going to look like when our kids now, when they leave high school or they leave college, are heading into a workforce where they're going to change firms every three or four years for the rest of their lives, not stay at a firm for 30 or 40 years. And what does that educational innovation look like? Mm -hmm. Uh, Governor Levin. Well, first, I I want to say that uh, for Senator Lee to have brought this together, I think, is indicative of what I see emerging in the United States Senate that makes me quite enthusiastic. And it's a group of U.S. senators like Senator Lee and like Senator Sass who uh, who recognize that the world has to change. Uh, in the way we approach government. And I think, uh, so my topic was uh, looking back over some experiences we've had here in Utah where innovation was used to change the way we do things. And I used the I-15 example. You'll yeah. remember um, uh, we were facing a, a situation where it could take us 12 years with uh, I-15 torn up, and we chose to use a design-build process that was much different than what had been done in the past. It was an innovation that required a a different kind of thinking. And I led the group through that discussion uh, and suggested that that kind of collaborative process is uh, what will ultimately produce productivity. And how many times did we talk about not only on time, but under budget and usually before time on that project? It really was amazing. It was a very good example of the way a government can begin to innovate uh, using something different than uh, th- th- what's happened in the mm-hmm. past. Senator Lee, before we take a break, uh, what did you uh, address, or what, what has your topic been at the uh, at the summit? My purpose today has been to facilitate a discussion on how we can develop policy innovation, how we can get more people involved, business leaders and government leaders alike coming together, and coming up with solutions to everyday problems that Utahns and Americans generally face. In particular, coming up with ideas that are designed to help get the federal government out of the way so that people can do what they do best. When we come back, we'll talk a little bit more about education. We will talk about some of the uh, other issues at hand, not the least of which is uh, health care nationally and even locally. And when we come back, we'll be talking with Senators. This is really an honor. I really appreciate uh, Senator Mike Lee uh, facilitating this today, not only the uh, summit, but Bringing people across the street, Mike, to uh, to join us here in studio, including your uh, colleague, Senator Sass, and our former uh, governor and the former Secretary of Health and Human Services, uh, Mike Levitt. Here, this is this is a great and what an opportunity to tap into the resource we have here when it comes to various topics. You know, education was mentioned, Senator Sass. You mentioned that, and and I'm not saying this to to schmooze our our former governor while he's here, but when I think back on an education governor, I think of I think of uh, Mike Levitt, not only because of efforts to reduce class sizes and so on, but boy, he brought uh, not only classrooms but state governments into the uh, into the uh, the the new brave world of uh, the internet and electronics and you know. You know, Governor, we, we used to talk about that all the time, how you wanted the very finest teachers in the state of Utah to be able to teach a class out at Tendik High School or to teach a class down in Paiute or whatever it might be, and it's amazing. And then to make the state services so much more user-friendly. That, that really has happened now. It has. That vision has been fulfilled. I think most university students now are, are using the Internet for at least some portion of their of their class load. I think we have the Utah Electronic Cost High School that's uh, literally tens of thousands of students. Uh, there are the six uh, high-tech high schools that are focused on math and science that are having a big impact. Charter schools uh, have changed the landscape. But all of those things happened during a very important period, I think, in Utah's history. and and. Uh, um, I was pl- proud to be part of it. I, meant, I remember when we opened the Olean Walker Center up at Weber State that we had, and Governor Bangader was still with us then, and we had uh, current Governor uh, Herbert, we had uh, former Governor Olean Walker, and we had uh, Governor Levitt on Skype. And I thought, boy, how, how prophetic and, again, how ironic that is. When you look at education for the country in general, Senator Sass, what, what are your hopes? What, what are the steps that we really can accomplish? 
Well, I mean, when you think about the hopes in the context of the American idea, it has always been that we believe in limited government because we believe in the maximal potential of individuals and of local communities and civil society and small businesses and the Rotary Club. When Alexis de Tocqueville came here in the 1830s and 40s trying to translate what America was for Europeans, he thought for about a week that you could understand the greatness of America by understanding the bureaucracies of Washington, D.C., and he realized you can't. You have to go to every town. You have to go to every Rotary club and see that dynamism. We need to see that kind of civil society and grass tops flowering again. And the only way you can do that is if you help prepare people for lifelong learning where they're going to take real ownership of this. So Governor Levitt mentioned specific ways that you can do local educational delivery, but we need an aspirational vision for all of our kids of every neighborhood, of every race, of every background to thrive and, and to soar. And right now that's not really the conversation we have, which is too Washington centric. Senator Lee, I I have some questions regarding health care uh, of these two gentlemen, and I know you have to leave here in just a moment for some other obligations regarding the, the summit. But as you look at this effort and you look at what has been accomplished today, what, what do you, where do you hope uh, that the next step is? What, what is the role for a, a summit like this to set the path and, and to move on? Last year, we built on the need for regulatory reform. And today, um, our, our focus will dwell a lot on things like transportation and education. Each time we hold one of these summits, we hope to pull a, walk away with a few good ideas that we can develop into reform policies, into part of my reform agenda. And after hearing Senator Sass talk today about the higher education system, it's given me some new insights uh, that I intend to use as, if I, as I develop some of my uh, reform proposals in that arena, particularly with regard to my Higher Education Reform Opportunity Act. Um, we're always looking for ways to improve that, and I think we got some ideas today that are going to help us do that. Senator Mike, thank you so much for joining us here at KSL. And as I mentioned, he's got obligations that continue on with the summit that is underway, and we do have uh, access to our former governor and to uh, Senator Sass for just a few more moments. And I'd like to utilize that time to chat about uh, health care. And uh, boy, uh, G- Governor Levitt, this is uh, right up your alley over health and human services during the, uh, the final term of uh, George W. Bush and also with your experience as governor of the state of Utah. When we look at Obamacare, when we look at the ramifications for the states, you look at the struggle we're having in our state right now on e- extension of, of Medicaid and Healthy Utah, now it's called uh, Utah Access Plus, and many people are, th- are thinking that perhaps within the Republican con- caucus, this, this might not even see the light of day now. From your point of view, where do we need to go with health care? We have to start this conversation by recognizing that there's a widely held aspiration socially for everyone to have access to an affordable insurance policy. And there's a division among the parties and sometimes within parties on how the best way to go about that is. But we have a common goal. And it's uh, my view, for example, here in Utah, that there's been a collaborative process that's been underway uh, between the House and the Senate and the governor on Medicaid. And, and, and I'm frankly hopeful that they can find a Utah way to solve that. And when I say Utah way, I'm talking about weighing the values of Utah and not necessarily being bound by what has been known as the uh, Obamacare or the Affordable Care Act, solving a Utah problem the Utah way. And uh, I think Governor Herbert has put a rational and reasonable proposal on the table. He has the support of the Senate. The House seems to uh, not find it acceptable up to this point. I think there will be some uh, discussion, of course, this week about it. Uh, I hope they can find a way to get it done because there are people in this state who have legitimate needs who are part of that widely held aspiration that we need to find a way to solve. Now, if, in fact, uh, the rules change in Washington, then the state legislature has to step back and say, what does that mean for us, and make mm-hmm. a decision. I, I think of some, I emceed an event where you were the keynote speaker, and it was in 2010, right after the Republican convention. And I remember people were peppering you with questions at one point about Obamacare. And I remember, and boy, again, you know, very foretelling, you said there are lots of aspects of this that the American people like. There are roots and tentacles that are going down right now. And for those who think this is going to be an easy thing to uh, uproot, uh, you, you might want to have second thoughts about that. Well, again, uh, the, the aspiration that we have for Americans to have insurance 
is nothing in my mind to do with o- with Obamacare or the Affordable Care Act. Uh, and I'm, not, I'm out of politics now, and so my problem is different than those who are in politics. My job is to figure out with how we deal with what we have today. Mm-hmm. Uh, and there are things in the Affordable Care Act that I think do bring uh, value. One of them is movement from it, 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 there are things that begin to accelerate the movement away from fee-for-service medicine toward one that gives health care providers incentive to provide better care at a lower cost. Now, they didn't originate it. It just happens to be uh, Ben and I were actually, Senator Sass and I were actually working at the Department of Health and Human Services, uh, and we developed a series of uh, waivers and demonstration models that were borrowed heavily from on parts of it. Mm-hmm. But where the Affordable Care Act got sideways uh, with most Americans, me included, uh, and I think uh, certainly Senator Sass, is that they injected so much federal government into right. it and spent so much money that we didn't have that it just uh, uh, made it illogical and over the top for most people. Absolutely. You know, I, I appreciate what, what Governor Levitt said because I, I shock some of my conservative friends when I remind them that this discussion of making health care available – and having some kind of a national program even for health care goes clear back to Franklin Roosevelt. And two of the biggest proponents were Harry Truman and then at one point Richard Nixon. And so it's interesting. Where do you see the health care issue uh, going? Well, thanks, Doug. I, I appreciate a lot of what Governor Levitt said. And I think implicit in, in some of that was a distinction between the access piece and the cost piece. One of the things that I think we should admit is that Obamacare made a bunch of promises about how it was going to get additional folks insured. It got some of those insured, not as many as they said, but it got more people into the system. But the cost projections about how that was going to happen haven't borne out to be accurate at all. And so I think we should recognize that over the next, quite aside from, apart from elections for a minute, just over the trajectory on spending over the next five to ten years, Obamacare is not a durable structure for American health care when you have an unsustainable cost curve, you're ultimately going to have some sort of massive reform. And when those cost controls come into being, they're either going to come from the center or the periphery. If the center, it means we migrate toward an even more European model with rationing of access and prices to drugs, devices, and procedures coming from bureaucrats. I don't hear people in Nebraska or Utah asking for more Washington control. We need more decentralized control so you can actually have innovation in the healthcare delivery system so the doctors and the nurses and the tech companies and the med device companies and the pharmaceutical innovators can be helping find ways to empower patients by delivering higher quality, lower cost care. We're going to need a lot more reform. Obamacare didn't get us to where we need to go. Gentlemen, I can't thank you enough for joining us. I wish we had hours to talk. I so appreciate being able to tap into your expertise, your wisdom, your knowledge, and be able to ask questions. And, you know, like in the old days, we could have opened it up to uh, to the listeners, Governor, and we could have solved some people's uh, pothole and sewer issues, too. We ought to have a just for old time's sake. <laughs> uh, let me speak to the former governor uh, I, sometime. And we I can... like the concept. All right. I like the concept. Former Governor Mike Lovett with us and Senator Sass, what a pleasure to have you here and what, uh, what a, a pleasure it is to get to know you. Thank you, Doug. Let's take-